Okay. So I'm going to raise the notch just a little bit. I'm going to sort of start where Virginia ended up. But what I want to do is really talk about um, not so much technology and AI, though that's going to be implied by this. But my job is really to address the world and context in which AI and new technologies and our new forms of data collection and storage and analytics are actually being introduced. So what's the world like in which this is being brought in and how does that bear on what we do? As a political scientist, I am going to emphasize government and collective action, the stuff of politics. And as a political economist, I am also primarily concerned about the larger framework in which we are operating. So what I'm going to argue for is um, a new moral political economy. All political economic frameworks embody values. All are moral in that sense. But we want the values to be explicit, not implicit. We want to be able to argue about them. We want to be able to agree on them. We want to be able to know what they are. And we want to emphasize, one of the reasons I like the term moral political economy, is that it emphasizes that these are moral and political choices. They're not just givens. They're something we can do something about, and I'm going to emphasize that as I talk. They're choices we can make. So I want to start by telling you that our old framework is fraying. I think you all know that. Its institutions no longer serve us well. Its model of behavior demands updating. Its values are contested. So let me give you a little history here. I think this, yeah. The major achievement of the old moral economy, the one that Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and their favorite economists, such as Milton Friedman and von Hayek, uh, built is that they made one set of values and assumptions about humans and their institutions, their values and assumptions, seem like the only set of values and assumptions we could possibly hold. That is not the case. What are those values and assumptions that, they've, that they introduced and that most of us or many of, certainly many of our governments bought into? That we as decision makers are perfectly rational and narrowly self-interested, i.e. deeply selfish. <laughs> that firms should single-mindedly maximize shareholder return without regard to the dignity or needs of workers or the consequences for consumers or the environment. That government should stop providing goods and services people need or want, i.e. introduce austerity measures of various kinds. And that relatively unfettered markets will ultimately benefit all who work and strive. These are all assumptions and arguments. They are not facts. This is not arguing about truth. This is about assumptions that we take into our models and that then inform how we practice and what we do. They are contested, and we can put in other values and assumptions. And in fact, I'm arguing that we do that. We need a better model of behavior. The model of behavior, oops, that's not right. Hmm. OK, we'll find it. There we go. We need a, a real different change, a need a change in perspective on what people are like. The assumptions that uh, underlay the old moral economy were what economists had to work with at that time. We've advanced a lot since the 70s and 80s. Uh, these three people won the Nobel Prize for really transforming our ideas about how people behave and about what they care about. Humans. Are, by their arguments, um, this is certainly from Danny Kahneman and from Richard Thaler, humans who reason are humans reason poorly and often make flawed decisions. They are not perfectly rational. Humans are social, and this is from Eleanor Ostrom as well. Humans are social and interactive by nature. We are not totally individualist, narrowly self-interested. Humans care about others, people, animals, the earth. We're not narrowly self-interested. So we need to introduce these assumptions based on more realistic notions of what humans care about and how they actually act into our models of the economy and the polity. 
we need new principles of institutional design. We still have to provide incentives for behaviors and actions we want, and monitoring and punishment for those we don't. My own work, for example, is about um, how we ensure how we want to monitor those who are actually doing the free riding, not everyone, but the ones who are violating the rules who are not playing by the game. We want to make sure they are punished so that the rest of us can act ethically um, without feeling suckered. So we punish the actual free riders and not the whole population. We don't have to monitor everybody. But institutions that, that we need to build have to be based on more realistic assumptions of behavior and have to be aimed at creating confidence and trust in those institutions. Confidence and trust among the people who are actually interacting within those institutions and of the providers and services in the private as well as in the public sectors. So we need more than an economic framework if we're gonna build a new moral political economic, political economy. We need demand and vote for governments that serve us better. The Indiana case, Mitch Daniels is a very good example. That was a choice by the people of Indiana and they got what they paid for or voted for or those who succeeded in winning that vote. We need to create a social infrastructure that provides links among diverse communities and peoples we meet, need to promote a value structure that elevates both the need for survival and the need for dignity, that emphasizes equity and inclusiveness, the point of this conference. So what we want is a 21st century version and more teched up version of the world portrayed nearly a thousand years ago on the walls of the Siena City Hall. This is the effects of good government, of a civil society. It's a world in which we will feel safe, we cooperate with each other, we share, we can be productive, we can have free time, and we can have lots of fun. We can dance outside the walls. And we are as hot, healthy as we possibly can be. So what people need from this world and how we have to think about these institutions that we're gonna create is they need respect and dignity as providers of services, and here I'm gonna to begin to bring it into the medical world a little bit. Acknowledgement of their contributions by hierarchical superiors and by clients. They need meaningful work with reasonable hours. We know there's a huge burnout, not just of doctors, but indeed of many providers. And, they, and many of them don't get very much publicity. We see the high-end professionals who burn out. We don't see all the people on the front lines, the street-level bureaucrats, who really can't survive under the conditions under which they're made to operate, and they burn out, even though they're providing incredible services to us. We need to, to ensure that recipients of services um, feel that they are people, that they're getting the dignity and respect they deserve, and we need to make sure that care is back in care work. I think Allison's gonna talk a little bit about that later, certainly has written about that. And we also need to ensure that people have adequate financial support, some of what Virginia was also, and others have also been referencing. That's pay, but it's also insurance. So we have a ways to go in providing goods and services adequately and providing goods and services in a way that leaves recipients with dignity. I'm gonna give a little example here. I was listening to a podcast of a black woman gay venture capitalist, rather a unique personage in her world, um, named Arlen Hamilton, who grew up poor, another vector which is unusual in the world of venture capitalism. And she tells a story about how she got a free Thanksgiving dinner one year. They, the kids were very worried were they gonna get Thanksgiving dinner, the poor kids in the school who were getting free lunches, but they didn't want it to just be announced, you go over there, you're the ones who get free lunches and free Thanksgiving dinner, and the rest of you don't. So there was an announcement in the school that some people had won a free Thanksgiving dinner. They felt very proud to have won this, and they were, of course, the poor kids who needed the Thanksgiving dinner. 
So poverty often produces indignities, also poor health. An inadequate attention to the social determinants of health and well-being, to the structural factors that we will have a role in sustaining, that we all have a role in sustaining, is a crucial part of what we need to do. So let me give some figures here. Joelle, can you hit that gap minder, see if it comes up? So you've probably all seen these kinds of statistics. This is Gapminder that Hans Rosling did. And what you're watching is on one axis is life expectancy and on the other is um, poverty. And you're seeing, or no, the world. And you're seeing how there has been change over time. I'm gonna tell you what all those colors mean in a minute, but that green one that's leading the way is guess where? the US, so it's been caught up here. The big red one moving fast is China, and the other big red one is India. So we've seen a huge change in these things over um, the years. Let me show you some other statistics. Can you move it back to the slideshow? Okay, so if we look at lifespan versus income, which is what that was, on the same income level, we can see that there are huge differences in lifespan. From 50 all the way up to 75 years, depending on how the money is the 70 years or 75 years that Mark was using. This is a little higher. So depending how the money is distributed and how it's used, we can see huge variations um, in the same income level. So it really comes back to government and policy, right? I want to turn to some other charts. These are from um, these are from the Global Access to Health Care Index, and the U.S. does very. These are the actual indices, the components of global access to health care that are used to look at 60 countries worldwide. Um, this is done by the Economist every year and by some of their statistical sources. And these are great indicators. I mean, they're what we'd all agree on. So let's look at what's happening around the world. Again, you can see money really matters, what the income level is, but we're also going to emphasize expenditure. So the writing on the bottom is by me. I just uh, am recovering from a fractured elbow. And I have to say, my doctor did a great job of giving me back use of my arm, but he did not improve my handwriting. So, but it started bad. I can't really blame him for that. But I just wanted to make sure you knew what the HDI was, which is the Human Development Index. And here you can see that the correlation between the Human Development Index and the global, and global access to health care is pretty clear. If you're low on the HDI, you don't get very good health care. If you're higher on the HDI, which is measuring things like income, um, and other environmental factors, thank you, um, you do much better. This is the corruption index, corruption perception index, and the relationship between global access. Again, you see corruption, um, if you're pretty free of corruption, like the Netherlands, you're gonna do really, really well. Um, and if you're very high in corruption, you're going to do very, very badly. But there's a lot more range here because income and other things obviously have an influence. So how is the U.S. doing in all these things? It's clearly one of the top performing countries in the global access to health care. Um, and I've put next to it the lowest performing country. So India is a middle income country, but you can see it's doing very badly because of the distribution um, within the country and the decisions by the government about how to expend its money. But when we look at other ac access to healthcare indicators, I didn't include the ones where the US is in the top 10. I thought I'd include the ones where it's not to give you a sense of this. The US is notably missing from a whole bunch of these statistics. The top performing countries in the accessibility domain, it's not there even though it's the richest country in the world. It's not there among the top performing countries in the area of access to child and maternal health services. 
nor is it there among the top performing countries in the area of access to medicine as opposed to healthcare. But I want to bring it back to another level as well. And within the US, there's huge variation, as we saw from Mark Collins' slides, about um, death and, and when people will, where they're likely to be predicted to die before they're 70. We've also done a really poor job in making our, holding our corporations and our responsible for the conditions under which workers work. There are a huge number of dangerous jobs that still exist in the US, and that obviously affects health, and that's clearly related to income. You know, people in worse jobs tend to have worse conditions. Particularly true of agricultural workers. This is worldwide. Agricultural workers have terrible heat-related deaths. I could show you the statistics internationally, but the US does not come out well in that. It's got third world statistics on things like heat-related death in US agriculture. OK, so let me conclude. What is to be done? I'm on time, right? What is to be done? Technology can help us, but it is just an aid. It is not the fundamental problem. It's not the fundamental solution. What we need is corporate and political will. Industries have to cease creating unsafe conditions for their workers, and sometimes for all of us with their pollutants and other problems. But ultimately, we can't just ask corporations to behave well, given what I've already said about the assumptions underlying the moral political economy. We need government regulation and service provision. And that, in turn, depends on us. Our governments are, at least in democracies, are in principle responsive to what citizens do. We have to mobilize. We have to make demands. We have to hold our governments accountable. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.